Okay, hello everyone. I'm delighted to have here Inigo Martin Corena. He's a group leader at the Sanger Institute, and he's mostly interested in understanding somatic mutation variation in healthy tissues, but also in the context of cancer and aging. He has done a lot, and he's doing a lot of work also related to the developing new methods to look at uh, somatic mutagenesis in a single cell resolution, and uh, in studying somatic mutagenesis also somatic mutations in other species other than humans and in diseases that are not related to cancer. So there's a, you know, a very uh, different types of, um, of research lines that are related to the origins of somatic mutation and the impact on health and disease. Um, he did his PhD in, in, at the EBI um, in evolutionary genomics, and then he moved to um, the, uh, the Sanger Institute in 2013, where he did a postdoc, and then in 2016, he became a leader at the Sanger Institute. So I'm looking forward to hear your talk. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for the introduction and yeah, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, yeah, so the topic of my talk is uh, I, what I thought I would do is I would just give you a, a bit of a summary of the journey that we have um, that we have taken in the past few years, uh, trying to unravel somatic mutation in normal tissues. <clears throat> so. The um, focus of my group and of my close collaborators, Peter Campbell and Mike Stratton at the Sanger Institute, is uh, trying to understand somatic mutation in normal tissues. So we know, nowadays we know, th thanks to um, cancer genome sequencing, we now know a lot about uh, mutations in cancer. And that's, uh, that's technically possible because cancers are the expansion of a single cell into millions of cells. So you can take a biopsy of a tumor uh, and do whole genome sequencing and all of the cancer cells share the same mutations that were pre-existing in that um, original cell. So it's technically feasible to sequence cancer genomes, and that's what has enabled the boom of cancer genomics over the past uh, 10, 15 years. Um, what we know much less about is about the accumulation of somatic mutations in normal cells. Um, we're very interested in this question first because it's a fundamental uh, piece of biology that we know very little about. But also, it has two key translational implications. The first one is understanding how mutations accumulate in our cells is key for understanding the first steps to cancer and hopefully informing early detection. Also, for many decades, somatic mutations have been speculated to contribute to aging. Uh, that remains largely unproven, um, but it's, it's likely that somatic mutations play some, some role as part of many other processes in aging and potentially other diseases. And, the reason why this has remained largely unproven is because we have been blind to somatic mutations uh, until very recently because of uh, technical limitations. The reason is that unlike sequencing a tumor, as I said, a tumor, the expansion of a cell into millions, easy to sequence, sequencing normal tissues is much more difficult because the normal tissue is a composite of different cell types. Um, and, and even within a cell type, uh, mutations are typically present in very small numbers of cells. Any given mutation is typically present in very small numbers of cells. In some tissues, it's there, they're present in single cells, like in neurons that don't divide uh, since birth. Mutations should be present in a single cell because that cell never divided. So this work started for us with these, um, this paper in 2015. Um, this is work that I did during my postdoc with Peter Campbell and, my, and, and Phil Jones at the Sanger Institute. Um, and really, this was the first time that we, that we detected somatic mutations in, in a normal solid tissue. Uh, and we chose to do this in a sun exposed skin. Um, and the challenge was that to be able to detect mutations present in very small numbers of cells. We knew from studies in the 1990s that used 53 immunostaining that you can find in normal skin of healthy people, you can find uh, small areas of 100 cells or a few hundred cells, small areas with uh, mutated 53. Uh, and we knew from these studies how small these stones are, typically a tenth or to a hundred square millimeter in size, so very small microscopic uh, clones. And really detecting these with standard sequencing at the time uh, was really not possible if you were to take a, you know, a small biopsy, even a, even a millimeter biopsy, of normal skin uh, and do 30 x whole genome sequencing, you wouldn't see any of this because they are too small. Um, so instead, what we designed was, was this strategy uh, in which we took, we first separated the epidermis from the underlying dermis to focus on a single cell type, then took um, about 100 times biopsies uh, or 50 to 100 times biopsies per individual, and each biopsy was about one square millimeter in size, and then deep 
deep targeted sequencing uh, of this biopsy and developing new bioinformatic algorithms to detect mutations down to about 1% uh, of the biopsy. So because the biopsies were one square millimeter in size and our detection sensitivity was down to 1% of cells in the biopsy, we could detect clones, but the, the expectation was that we would start to see these, these uh, mutant clones appearing because our detection sensitivity was so okay. <clears throat> What we found in this study was much more than we expected. The first thing, uh, you know, at the time we didn't, you know, we didn't know how many mutations we would see per cell. Uh, we didn't know whether it would be a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand. And it turned out that uh, normal skin cells in sun exposed areas actually had a much higher burden of mutations than we had expected, over ten thousand somatic mutations per skin cell, uh, mostly caused by ultraviolet light. Um, but really the big surprise of this study was that these mutations were not random. We saw a very high frequency of mutations in key cancer genes, and this was in healthy uh, skin from normal healthy individuals. Uh, the reason for that is that when, uh, and this, this was the big surprise of this study, that when a mutation occurs in a, in a key cancer gene in the context of a normal tissue, and this happens all the time, they, it leads into a small microscopic clone expansion, a bit like the clone that you saw earlier, but a much larger scale when you look at all genes uh, in the genome. We found that um, by middle age, about a quarter of all cells have already acquired a cancer mutation uh, in a key uh, skin cancer gene. And this happens everywhere in the skin so that you get about 100, 100 of these uh, microscopic clones with cancer mutations uh, per square centimeter. And again, this was done in four healthy individuals at the time. Uh, what this plot represents is, is meant to, is, a, is an abstraction of the sequence and data, it's simulated directly from the sequence and data. It represents uh, one square centimeter, so one centimeter by one centimeter of normal skin, with its, its circle represented a different clone, colored according to the, to the cancer gene mutated. Um, yeah, so you get you get a sense of the the, the number of these clones so, uh, and, and sort of the and the density of these clones. So, so we we found that sun exposed skin is a patchwork of competing with mutant clones. <clears throat> At the time, we didn't know whether this was a phenomenon that was exclusive of normal skin. That was a possibility because skin is heavily uh, sun exposed. It's, it's certainly the most mutagenized tissue of the human body. So. It was likely that this would be the, the, the most extreme example, but we did this follow-up study that we published in, in 2018, <clears throat> where we used a very similar design. We used the suffragus because it's very similar structurally to skin, uh, squamous epithelia that we could peel and do punch biopsies again. We did about 850 biopsies from nine individuals of different ages, um, sequenced them at a, at a bit of a higher coverage, targeted sequencing, um, yeah. And this, this was work with Phil Jones um, already when I was uh, a PI at Sanger. Um, what we found uh, was really shocking. For me, this was one of the most exciting findings that uh, probably of my career because I never expected to see anything as extreme as what we had seen in this team. But what we found in the esophagus was actually a higher density of these driver clones that we had found in the skin. And the interesting thing is that the mutation rate per cell it's about 10 times lower in the esophagus. You don't have ultraviolet light mutagenesis, you just have age-related accumulation of mutations, uh, what we call signatures one and five. Um, so it's, it's not heavily mutagenized, but positive selection is very strong. Um, so when these mutations occur, uh, they essentially get this stronger takeover um, you know, by middle age. This is a 58-year-old non smoker for example. So this was a big surprise. and, and to me, uh, immediately got my mind racing about if this is what happens in healthy people, you know, what happens in the context of disease, what happens in the context of different exposures and so on. Just to give you a sense of the gene level, we found a very rich selection landscape. Uh, at least 14 genes were under very clear positive selection. The way we studied this in somatic evolution was uh, we used, we have adapted methods from evolutionary biology, like the DNDS method to look at the relative non-synonymous to synonymous a uh, number of mutations per gene accounting for uh, covariates, epigenom epigenomic covariates across the genome and so on. Um, this was some of the work that I did during my postdoc, but we use this uh, DNDS method now in somatic evolution all the time to understand which genes are conferring uh, on the cells a, a positive uh, selection advantage. So a very strong positive selection, a very large number of mutations, about 120 different clones with a notch one mutation, 40 different clones, per square centimeter with 53 mutations. Um, 
about about 30 to 40 percent of the esophagus by middle age is already colonized by notch one mutant cells. So that gives you a sense of the strength of positive selection. Um, yeah, and in this this study of just nine patients, we found on the order of 2,000 drive mutations uh, in notch one alone, and on the order of 4,000 drive mutations across the small panel of genes that we sequenced. Uh, and you know, that's 4,000 driving mutations in a size of normal tissue, the equivalent of the three postal stamps. And that's, a, you know, in order for you to find these many driving mutations, you would need to sequence about 1,000 tumors with, from TCGA, um, so about four, four mutations per tumor. So really a very high density. Of course, these mutations occur as single mutations in different clones. So there's not a single cell that has, you know, five or six, otherwise you would have a cancer, but they occur in different clones. This gives you a sense of the variation across the nine individuals that we sequenced. This goes from a 22-year-old male to a 75-year-old male sorted by age. Um, two things I want to draw your attention to. The first one is, is notice how age dominates, how this is a phenomenon of aging. Um, you get more and bigger clones and they take over the tissue as you age. Uh, this, you know, by the by 75 years of age, this individual is already but a quarter of the esophagus has already lost page three. And, and again, remember, if you were to have sequenced these esophagus with standard sequencing, you wouldn't see these clones because there are different 53 mutations in different clones. Um, so that's one thing, the, 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 the dominance of age. And it made us think, because we were looking at this from the lens of cancer, but you know, this is happening in all of us all the time. It made us think about whether these clones could contribute to aging as well. The, the second, uh, the observation is that even though age dominates, you can see plenty of variation across individuals. So these are three middle-aged individuals. This is a heavy smoker. This is a moderate smoker, and this is a non-smoker, for example. You can see plenty of, of heterogeneity. And really, with nine individuals, we don't know what explains this heterogeneity. Is it environmental exposures? Is it lifestyle habits? Is it genetics? We don't know. So, and, and you will see towards the end of my talk, how this is a major motivation for what we are doing now is developing new technologies to enable these studies at a, you know, at a much larger scale. Remember that to generate these nine little plots, we had to sequence about 900 biopsies um, and we needed to have invasive tissue biopsies at the time of death. So it's not something that you can roll out uh, at scale, but we are developing the technologies to be able to do that now. So these two studies were the motivation for, for looking at this question and you know, what we really wanted to do after this was to, to do this systematically across tissues uh, of, the, of the human body and also to look at different risk factors and, and diseases. Uh, and to this end, we have been developing two key technologies over the past four or five years. Um, to sequence almost any other tissue other than skin, esophagus, and some other epithelia, you cannot do punch biopsies of one millimeter in size because they, most of the tissues are much more complex and epithelia are much thinner. So for example, this is an area of pancreas. And, and really what you want to sequence here, for example, is this little area, which is a pre-malignant uh, pancreatic, pancreatic pre-cancer lesion. Um, and you couldn't, you know, this is about a millimeter in size. So if you were to take a fast biopsy, you have a very heterogeneous mixture. But what we have developed is um, laser microdissection uh, followed by low input whole genome sequencing. The idea is, uh, to avoid uh, single cell sequencing, because for DNA, single cell sequencing is too noisy. It introduces more errors than real somatic mutations. So we can't, unfortunately, today rely on single cell sequencing. So instead, what we did was reduce the amount of DNA that you need to generate the whole genome um, and to down to about 300 cells, avoiding whole genome amplification, um, and couple that with laser microdissection so that you can now you know, sit in the computer and select different areas of tissue and, and get the um, the genome, essentially. We have applied now these, uh, this technology in, in many tissues, in colon, liver, and mitre, and several others. I think I have some slides next on some of them. The other technology, and I will talk about this method later, is NanoSeq, which is not single uh, cell sequencing, but it's single molecule sequencing, as you will see. And that allows us to detect mutations that are present in a single cell, not by sequencing a single cell, by sequencing a population of cells, but having the resolution of detecting mutations in single molecules. 
So just to give you a sense of what you, what you can do with these um, with this technology, this was a study that we did in my group. Uh, it's, it's mainly the work of PhD students in the group called Andrew, very talented. And what he did what we, in this study, what we wanted to do was um, the skin and esophagus were exciting, but we know that they are some of the most some of the fastest dividing tissues of the human body. We wanted to see whether this phenomenon was uh, could also happen in tissues that divide much less. And we went to uh, bladder, which is a very slow cycling uh, epithelium. And we applied, instead of doing the punch biopsy, which would have mean taking a, you know, these mites into sequencing, what we did was, um, and really we're interested in mostly in mutations occurring in the epithelium, which is the set of origin of bladder cancers. This is muscle, this is trauma, fibroblast, and epithelium, really we're interested in the mutations here. So what we did was using this laser microdissection to isolate microscopic areas of urethelium and do a full genome sequencing. And with this study, we found, uh, we didn't know what to expect, but uh, we found hundreds of microscopic clones and very strong selection. Most of the clones were again microscopic. You can see here an image of different areas that we sequenced and how the same gene is the key bladder cancer gene is mutated across the epithelium, but you can find different mutations across the epithelium. So again, if you were to take this full biopsy and sequence it bulk, you wouldn't see any of them, but by uh, isolating different clones individually, you can see them. So this study, and this is sort of a big, sum, uh, it's a very short summary of, of, of a big paper, but this study found, uh, a main thing was that we found a lot of variation across individuals. These were healthy individuals, but we found a surprising amount of variation in the mutation, in the rates of mutation, in the signatures of mutation, suggesting that different people are exposed to different mutagens in their lives. Um, some of these mutation or signatures that we found, we were not known, and, and some of them we don't have an explanation for. So presumably, you know, there are exposures out there that we're, you know, we're constantly being exposed to that are causing mutagenesis and we're not aware of them. Uh, this individual, for example, has a mutation or signature very dominant that, that we have never seen before or after. Uh, the, the same sort of heterogeneity in mutation, in mutation rates and signatures apply to the frequency of cancer mutation. So I, this is, the, this is the top mutated genes, all bladder cancer genes, and these are different donors. And I just want to draw your attention to a couple of donors. This is a 53-year-old female, 35 different clones with KDM6A, two clones with a red one a Compare that to this other uh, donor who has 20 red one a mutations with four KDM6A. So what we're seeing is that not only mutation rates and signatures vary across individuals, but selection to favor the growth of different clones varies a lot across individuals. Just to summarize, uh, these, these papers and these studies and, and, and similar studies by others um, are revealing a previously invisible world of somatic evolution happening in our tissues as we aged. I think that that was a big surprise for us and others. And we think there is an exciting emerging field. Um, here is a question of what happens in other tissues and, and it's important to understand pre-cancer and, and, and early detection. I am very keen, as you will see towards the end of my talk, uh, very keen to expand these studies. Given how much variation we are seeing, what you want to do is to do this across thousands of people and really establish correlations with exposures and genetics and so on. So I'm very excited about looking into large cohorts. If this works and if this could be done in a non-invasive way, it could also be a tool for predicting cancer risk, for example, or identifying individuals that are at high risk of cancer. This is, is sort of more far-fetched, but I am very excited about this idea. The fact that we carry these clones with us and they are growing very slowly throughout life opens the door to intervening. Is there anything that we can do to alter this uh, if we find treatments, but also simple lifestyle prevention strategies that change these? Um, you know, this could be valuable to, to, you know, to do prevention or chemo prevention or sort of molecular prevention in a, in a more rational way. And then we, at a more basic level, we are very interested in, in knowing, you know, these mutations are occurring in all of us. They weren't detectable before. Could they be contributing to diseases that we have no link, not known link to somatic mutations? For example, could these mutations be contributing to type 2 diabetes? Could mutations in beta cells could affect that or in liver? and so on. So we have quite a few projects in my team looking at different diseases. So in the second part of my talk, I just want to show a, a paper that we published uh, earlier this year. And it's quite a fun, it was quite a fun story. 
we realized that all of our knowledge on somatic mutations was limited to um, to humans, and I was very keen to look beyond humans uh, and look at different mammals. Um, this is work by, by Alex Kagan and Adrian, uh, two postdocs in my group. Um, I had two hypo we had two hypotheses when, when we did study. The first one was related to aging and the second one to cancer. So the first one, aging. For decades, it has been speculated that mutations contribute to aging. If that is true, you might expect that a species that live, um, that have a very short lifespan, like a mouse, may mutate much faster than species that have a long lifespan, like humans. So that's a simple prediction. Do mutation rates scale with lifespan? Another um, hypothesis that we had is that mutation rates may vary with uh, body size or body weight. The reason for this is that um, it's called Peter's paradox, which is that given that cancer emerges from a single cell and a whale has um, thousands, and thousands of times more cells than a mouse, or you know, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands uh, more cells than a mouse, uh, they should have a much higher risk of cancer, but they don't. Evolution has found ways of suppressing cancer risk in large body species. So the question is how it has happened. One possibility is that some mutation rates have evolved to be lower in this species. If that's the case, we would expect rates to scale with body size. So with these ideas in mind, we applied uh, our technology to uh, other species. And this was a massive logistical challenge, but also a massive bioinformatic challenge because detecting somatic mutations uh, is difficult enough to do with humans. You're looking at very rare things, but detecting it in species with um, really, really poor genome assemblies was a big challenge. So some of the genome assemblies had hundreds of thousands of conflicts. So that was a big challenge. The way we chose to do it was by focusing on a tissue, which was colon. Um, and that's because colon is organized, the colonic epithelium is organized into crypts. Uh, and we know from studies in humans that crypts are clonal units. So uh, there is a, a single stem cell, there are several stem cells in the, in, at the base of the crypt that populate the crypt, but through drift, uh, normally a single cell takes over a crypt pretty, pretty quickly. So you can laser microdissect the, a whole crypt and do whole genome sequence on a single crypt, and that gives you the mutation rate in that stem cell. Uh, we also know that mutagenesis in, in, in colon is dominated by endogenous mutation of processes. We don't see evidence of exogenous mutagenesis in humans, so that was a good, a good place to, to look for to measure mutation rates. And they saw a linear accumulation of mutation with age. So what Alex did was first contact SUS, uh, vet, vet, vet schools, uh, research groups, to collect samples of known ages of uh, 16 different mammalian species. We're very keen to have something like the naked mole rat, which is a very small, uh, almost the size of a rat, but they live for about 30 years. Uh, it's always, it has always been a puzzle why that's the case. So we're very keen to have that species there. Um, and what he did was um, histology sections and then laser micro section and whole genome sequencing of about 250 uh, colonic crypts from 56 individuals of these 16 species. After a lot of bioinformatics and a lot of pain for about two, three, three, four years, we got the technology to work very well. Um, and this is the mutational signatures that we found. I don't know how familiar you are with mutational signatures. Indeed, what this book tells you is essentially the frequency of C2As, uh, C2Gs, C2Gs, C2As, C2Cs, C2Gs um, in different contexts. So these four things is essentially uh, C2T mutations in a CPG context, and if they, they occur to five methyl cytokine deamination, the spontaneous deamination of CPGs, methylated CPGs, of course, this. So what we found was that, I mean, basically, what you can see is that the plots are quite similar across species. So, and this was, you know, unexpected to us at the time, but the same three mutational processes, which you can deconvolute this using a non-matrix negative factorization, the mutational signatures field, you can deconvolute this by looking at variation of different patterns in different species into three main components. And these are all known components in human cancers. We know the mechanisms behind two of them. This one is less known. But these are, these are for those working in cancer genomics, these are very familiar signatures. These are these occur in human, human tissues. Uh, and you can see how they also dominate somatic mutagenesis across species, with some variation across species in the frequency of different ones, but overall the same three core uh, signatures. For this few species from which we had different individuals of different ages, we could confirm that the mutations increase with age. Uh, and that was very convenient and you know, have an intercept close to zero. And that was convenient because you can estimate the mutation rate per year for a species by 
dividing the number of mutations that you are seeing by the age of the individual, essentially, even when you don't have multiple individuals of different ages. And really, the, the big surprise in the study was that, um, that the somatic uh, the prediction from the aging theory really applies amazingly well to these data. So you can see here the mutation rate per cell per year in the different species and how that um, shows an inverse correlation in lifespan. This curve is not a complex fitting, it's just a one parameter fitting, which is that the mean mutation rate is, uh, is directly relate, related to the inverse of lifespan. That's why it's a curve. So the only thing that this is fitting is essentially, is this, you get this shape if all of the species end their lifespan with the same number of mutations per cell. And so, so that simple model explains about 82% of the variance in mutation rates across species. And really, rather surprisingly, body size does not, does not seem, seem to explain any residual variation on top of lifespan. So really, we're seeing the lifespan effect here uh, in, you know, much more strongly than we expected. So just to summarize, we've seen a similar end of lifespan mutation burden across species, about threefold variation in the rate across species, despite 25-fold differences in lifespan and 40,000-fold difference in weight. So that's, for some reason, that seems to be an invariant across, a relatively invariant uh, across uh, species. So if you're interested, you, we published that earlier this year, um, if you want to read more details, but this essentially fits a, a long-standing hypothesis in the field of aging. It, this prediction, this had been predicted or speculated about in the 70s, but it had remained untestable. But I should say, if this is consistent with the possible role of somatic mutations in aging, but it's not a proof of, uh, of that, it's a correlation at the end of the day. But certainly if we hadn't seen this association, it would be, you know, if we had seen that all the species mutated at the same rate per year, uh, and you have a mouse that ends their lifespan with 30 times less mutations than a human, then it would be difficult to argue that um, somatic mutations contribute to aging. At least what we have seen is certainly very consistent with that strong prediction. The how different species of different sizes avoid cancer um, is, is only partially answered by somatic mutations. We are seeing that you know very large species like giraffes or cows have low mutation rate because they also have uh, uh, long lifespans. But um, but because we are not seeing a, an effect of uh, body size beyond lifespan, then they must have other, other solutions like duplicating tumor suppressor genes. Um, and I should say that even though we're seeing these associations, even if you take, um, even if you assume that mutations are contributing causally, it, they probably are only one of many um, other processes. And you would expect other processes like telomere shortening rates to also correlate with uh, lifespan. And in fact, Maria Blasco published a couple of years ago um, a paper showing that telomere shortening rates also vary in the same way across species, um, which is an independent process. So we have a, a study, my, a project ongoing in my group, trying to expand these into more tissues and the wider tree of life looking at all the vertebrates and invertebrates and so on. Um, this, is, this is a bit more speculative, but uh, for a long time when people talk about aging and somatic mutations, they assume that somatic mutations are occurring and killing cells. When a mutation occurs, it's deleterious to the cell and the cell dies. Um, we're not seeing much evidence of death. We, are, we don't see signs of negative selection left in the survivors. Um, but what we are seeing is very strong positive selection uh, in solid tissues and the tissues uh, being colonized by these mut mutant clones that look very normal under the microscope, but are molecularly a bit aberrant. So we are thinking, you know, this is sort of changing how we're thinking about somatic mutations in the context of aging. That is probably not the mutations are just killing cells. They probably are not frequent enough to cause enough damage that way. But is the, is the takeover of tissues through these selfish neural expansions? That could have a role in uh, in aging, we think. And there's this nice study, uh, this nice review from the 19, 1962 by John Maynard Smith, a very famous evolutionary biologist that speculated about the possibility of competition between cells within tissues um, that could lead not just to cancer, but much more widely to um, you know, subtle changes in the tissue where selfish clones just take over the tissue over life. And this is the last part of my of my talk. Um, this is about this new method that I that I mentioned that is single molecule, and it's really changing how we're doing all these studies. Everything that I have presented, the skin, the esophagus, the bladder, the colon across species, 
it all relies on detecting clones. Uh, you need a self expanding to a clone for you to see it with the standard sequencing technologies. Even if you go very small and take a microscopic area of tissue, you still need that a cell has expanded because if the mutation is present in a single cell, it is indistinguishable from sequencing noise. Um, so we, with that in mind, and we were very keen to, to look at tissues that don't divide and, and to be able to sort of be free from having to depend on clones, we, we looked into single cell sequencing, but they were too noisy at the time. They are improving nowadays, and there's a lot of promise now in the last year or two. So I think, I think eventually the two we get there, but at the moment they're still not, not very good. Um, what we did instead is we, we started refining a different technology called duplex sequencing to, to achieve single molecule accuracy. So let me explain what duplex sequencing is. Um, you have a blood sample. Every cell has a different mutation represented here in different molecules of DNA. What you do is you fragment your, your DNA, ligate adapters with barcodes, um, and then take a very small number of, a very small number of molecules. Uh, much less than you would normally take for standard sequencing, and sequence it uh, to enough depth that you end up reading multiple copies of the same molecule. So you end, you end up reading the same molecule several times from, the, from both the top strand and the bottom strand of a DNA molecule. So if you have sequencing errors, we'll be pressing single, you know, single copies because they are random. Amplification artifacts, if you amplify this strand and make an error, could be present in all the subsequent copies, but they won't be present in both the strands. They will be present in one strand only, whereas real mutations will be present in all molecules. So by doing consensus calling, not at the level of looking at all of the reads that you have from different cells, but doing it at this level of single molecules, you can get highly accurate uh, mutation detection. That's the theory. Um, the, th the theory is that duplex sequencing could achieve error rates lower than one error per billion sites in single molecules of DNA, but in practice we found that it has a much higher error rate, and I will tell you why. Um, what we did was we applied standard duplex sequencing, whole genome duplex sequencing, to a sample of a, a human sample with very low mutation rates. We took a, a blood sample from a from core blood from a neonate, um, so so you know. Immediately soon after birth, you're born with about 50 mutations per cell. So very low mutation rate. Um, and what we did was use that as a negative control and apply duplex sequencing. And what we got were uh, over a thousand errors per cell or per genome equivalent. And we found that if the DNA was slightly damaged, you could have over, you know, much more than 10,000 errors per cell. So when you want to detect just 50 real mutations per cell, having 10,000 errors is not good. Um, so there, there was clearly a problem with, with duplex sequencing. Um, what, we, what we did, or the, 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 the two key bioinformaticians in the team did, was analyze the patterns of errors. Um, it doesn't sound like a great job because you want to look at biology, but actually it was extremely useful. What they found is they looked at, they, they realized that the error rates were, were very prevalent at fragment ends, uh, if, although they saw errors across the read length, but especially uh, in, at read ends. And analyzing the types of errors and the asymmetries between both strands, they concluded that the errors may be must be happening um, during end repair. So what happens when you fragment your DNA for duplex sequencing is you stonicate. Uh, when you break the DNA, you often need overhands. And to ligate adapters, you, you need to make them into double uh, into blunt ends. And to make them blunt ended, you normally use end repair, which uses a polymerase to copy this strand and just get a, a blunt end there. When you do that, any DNA damage that is pre-existing in a single strand gets um, gets copied into the, into the other strand, and you get now what looks like a real mutation, but it is just DNA damage that can happen in vitro. There are all the mechanisms. If you have single strand next here, when you do a tailing, you can have extension of that molecule and copy errors from the other strand, and again, it looks like a real mutation. So we realized that that was the main source of error. There are other sources of error, and essentially what uh, Rob and Fede did in, in, in my group over about three to, uh, to four years was iteratively refining the method. The way they essentially took this you know, blood sample with very low mutations in it, applied the best version of the protocol, analyzed the error pattern, think about what, what was causing the errors, and fixing, fixing them either through changes in the experimental protocol or in the bioinformatics. It, it, it was sort of iteratively. Improving, so we ended up avoiding sonication and repair, replacing it with a clean genome fragmentation using restriction enzymes, 
or using enzymatic fragmentation or stonication. And instead of instead of doing end repair, it's chewing the ends, it's getting rid of the ends with an action of case. We introduced the oxygen piece to prevent the extension of nicks. Uh, we there was a lot of bioinformatics to avoid any mapping errors because to achieve a 10 to the minus nine, nine error rate, you really need to avoid any error down to less than one in one per billion sites. So in, in the alignment, because you can have a misalignment. So we, we really had to avoid that. And removing and detecting and removing human contamination, because even 0.1% uh, of DNA from another human ending up in the library could, could lead to all of the SNPs in that individual appearing as somatic mutations. Um, so we have to get rid of that. And some maths and, um, and some experimental work to optimize the kicker rates. But after that, uh, we got the, error, the, the method to work and have error rates that were lower than uh, five errors per billion size per base pair, so fewer than 30 errors, much fewer than 30 errors per genome. That, that was as low as we could measure it, which means that for the first time we had accurate single molecule mutation detection. Um, and we, we could finally sort of be free from being limited to clones. So, so with that, I you know, the moment I, we had this technology, I was very keen to apply it to many questions. But one question that I was very interested in was stem cells are said to be protected from mutations. Uh, they're very important. Um, so they, they leave in, niche, in niches that are protected from mutations. Um, and I wanted to see whether differentiated cells are less protected and accumulate many more mutations. We couldn't have done that before because differentiated cells, by definition, don't divide anymore. Um, so we needed a method that were, was able to detect mutations down to single molecules or single cells. Um, so a place to look for these was in blood. In blood, you have uh, the hematopoietic hierarchy where you have long-term hematopoietic stem cells that divide maybe once or twice a year. And they produce short-term progenitors and multiple-term progenitors, and then a cascade of cell division where you have at least 28, probably many more cell divisions from a stem cell to producing a huge number of um, differentiated cells. So the other, this is an incredible number, on the order of 10 to the 11, granulocytes per day are produced in each of us, and they live, they live for a few days and, and die. So what we did was we wanted to compare the mutation rate in these cells, the mutation rate in these other cells that have undergone at least about 30 times more divisions, if not more, and which in theory should not, no longer be protected from mutagenesis. And the big surprise was that there is no difference. That we are seeing a very linear accumulation of mutations with age in the stem cells and a very, very similar statistically indistinguishable, it's slightly higher, but you know, maybe 10, 20 mutations, um, but it's statistically non significant um, um, increase in mutations in granulocytes. So we are really not seeing the increase in mutations that we had expected given the significant increase in cell divisions. And this made us think, and in fact, the mutational signatures look the same. So that made us think that actually cell division, which had for a long time been assumed to be the main source of somatic mutations, may not be so important and that other processes would be more important. Now, to test this further, again, taking advantage of the technology, we decided to look at truly non dividing cells and see what happens in them. And, and what we found is that indeed in cortical neurons and uh, in, in frontal cortex in the brain, which are meant to not have divided since birth, you can see the accumulation of mutations linearly with age. And in fact, if you compare the rates, I mean, if they, you know, by the end of so by age 100 or so, you would have about 2,000 mutations per neuron, very similar to the number of mutations in smooth muscle, which is also highly non dividing, um, but also very similar to the number of mutations in uh, hematopoietic stem cells, and in fact, very similar to the number of mutations in esophagus or skin, where the stem cells divide every few days. So, really, we think that. Um, that this suggests that uh, cell division is not a major driver of somatic mutagenesis in normal tissues. And we, th we think it must be uh, DNA damage and constant DNA repair, sometimes inaccurate repair, that is causing the accumulation of mutation. You can also see that the signatures, it tells you about the processes behind these mutations, they're again very similar with some differences in neurons, muscle, um, and blood here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're very excited by this technology. Uh, we, we're now able to sequence any cell population independent of tonality. Um, we, it has simplified the analysis of mutagenesis because you can now take a blood sample and just measure mutation rates in that individual uh, in bulk without having to do anything 
anything more complicated. Before we had to isolate stem cells from a blood sample and grow them into colonies and sequence individual colonies. Um, and really this bit here is probably what I'm most excited about at the moment with the group, which is that we can do uh, non-invasive somatic mutation studies. Um, so what we are doing, I think this is my last, yeah, that's my last uh, slide. We are doing a lot of this work at the moment. What we have done is refine nanostick to give us, and not just mutation rates and signatures, but give us these types of information. So the frequency of 53 and not one and so on, we can get this information now with nanostick. So with a single sequencing library, we can measure accurately now somatic mutation rate, mutation signature, and frequency of drivers. And what we want to do is these types of things, but across thousands of people now. Uh, because we no longer need to do a hundred little biopsies for a given individual or laser microdissection. So we have this this fun project in the team where we have uh, we have collaborated we have collaborated with Twins UK, which is a big uh, group of twins in the UK, um, and we have invited a thousand of them to we send them an envelope with a buckle swab like a like a COVID test, uh, and they do the collection. Uh, with a buccal swab, if you do it well, most of the cells that you get are from the oral epithelium. The oral epithelium is very similar to skin and esophagus. So it looks a bit like this. Um, so with that, they sample non-invasively, effectively thousands of micros microscopic clones, uh, right? Because they are microscopic. And when you do the swab, you sample uh, several centimeters of tissue. Um, and then they put it back in the envelope and, and put it in the, in, 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 in the mailbox and it comes to Sanger through the standard mail. Um, and with that, what we do is um, apply deep target analysis to get to get to get a measure for each individual of mutation rate signatures and drivers. Um, and we're key, we were keen to do it on a twin design because you can now compare what happens in identical twins versus non-identical twins. Um, and you know, to answer the question, how much of this variation is due to environment, how much is due to genetics? We also have very detailed questionnaires from these individuals whether. You know how much they exercise, what diet they have, uh, whether they like aubergines or not. You know anything that you can think of, we 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 have asked there, um, and we are just starting to generate data. But we are seeing very exciting things. For example, we are seeing that monozygotic twins are much more similar than uh, non-identical twins, um, suggesting that there could be a genetic um, basis for a lot of these variation, which is true. Open to those to you know, viewers and sort of. Um, genetic tools to, to, to look at the causes of this variation. So anyway, this this is what we have been doing over the past few years and what we what we are doing now. So with that, I just want to thank you for your um, attention and have to take any questions. And thanks to my group and collaborators. Okay, we got one of fantastic talk question here. Maybe start here and then we go over the okay. talks on the. the... Uh, one. Yeah. It could be. It's a really good question. We don't know. We have tried to get samples for a while, but with the methods that we had before, it wasn't easy. With the method that we have now and the buckle spot question, I won't revisit that question. It could be that, I guess that's what you are. Um, I'm guessing, but it could be that there is a variation in mutation rates across individuals and that supercentenarians happen to be on the low end. Um, and that would be really interesting to see. Too. People that age better. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so that's what we are. That's the sort of thing we want to do with the Buckle Swap studies is going after interesting groups of people or also people that are, for example, a typical question that we are asked is are these clones being suppressed by the immune system? And we don't know, but it would be amazing to be able to do these uh, with the buccal swab in someone that is immunodeficient or immune suppressed uh, to answer these questions. So a lot of things I think open up with these. these things. I was curious, uh, maybe so I'm doing transcriptomics and sometimes on the level where you have this. We have met Haven't we? Yeah, we yeah. have met in the same Yes, that's right. But yeah, yeah, you look familiar. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, I was curious um, if, if you, there are regions of the, when you do a whole genome sequencing regions of the genome that you miss, we have a complete picture. I don't know. Maybe yes, with the, with the nanostick version that we published in 2021, yeah. we only saw 30% of the genome because we because we use restriction enzymes as a way of getting blunt ended fragments. So you only got coverage around the restriction sites. Oh. Um, 
we were very, you know, that, that worked for a while and we we're happy to measure mutation rates and so on in 30% of the genome because you can extrapolate and it was a pretty random 30% of the genome. But if you want to look at the frequency of cancer mutations, you want to be able to sequence the cancer genes fully. So that's why in the past two years we have changed, we have changed that protocol and we don't do restriction enzyme for this protocol anymore. We do uh, either sonication and exonuclease flunting, or uh, we're trying some new enzymatic uh, fragmentation approach, and that gives us coverage of uh, the entire genome. So, one thanks for the talk again. Um, so, uh, so far, I've seen Brian calling in the context of cancer by comparing tumors to blood, mm -hmm. but your data would suggest that you have to compare it to more tissues because you have mm -hmm. a lot of potential. And also in the field of neoantigens, so targeting, mm -hmm. targeting by the immune system, these mutations in the tumor, you would also have to be very sure that the tumor is the only tissue having right. these mutations. Right? Yeah. How do you see this? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, Quite a few people ask that question. Actually, blood is a very good control because uh, when you do cancer genome sequencing, you don't use nanosig, you use standard sequencing. So, so there is very, only in the context of having a big clone in blood, which happens in clonal hematopoiesis and happens in very old people, only in that context, you would have a problem with blood as a much normal tissue. If you, in, in any of us, no, no mutation is going to be present in more than 1% of cells. Um, unless you have a leukemia or a pre-leukemia, no mutation is going to happen in blood at more than 1% of cells. So you can do standard whole genome sequencing at 30 eggs um, happily and safely as a control. Great uh, Yeah, the question of new antigens is a good one as well. Yeah, I mean, it is relevant. Uh, yeah, or even, you know, there have been problems in cancer genomics when they didn't have access to a blood sample and instead they took uh, an adjacent liver sample adjacent to the tumor. In that case, it's more problematic, not necessarily because of these microscopic clones, but because sometimes in the context of a tumor, you have a field effect where a single cell had, you know, you have pre malignant changes in other places. So, this, this selection that you're talking about that is different between tissues, do we know why it, why it happened? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, all of the genes that we're finding, and it partly relates to the fact that the cancer genes are different in different tissues, right? right? Um, the genes that we're finding in normal skin, for example, in normal esophagus, they're really interesting because they are all, they're all cancer genes of esophageal cancer. You see them mutated, but actually they are key regulators of um, stem cells of that tissue type, of, of keratinocyte stem cells. So for example, NOTCH1 is a good example. Um, if you make a hole in the skin, the way the wound is healed is, is the cells around the wound detect the absence of cells next to them uh, and then switch off notch one. Um, and because notch one is essential for producing differentiated cells. So a stem cell normally divides into another stem cell and a differentiated cell that goes up in, this, in the epithelium is lost. Uh, in the context of a wound, you don't want that to happen. You want the stem cell to produce two stem cells and then four until you repair the wound. And the way that's done is by suppressing briefly notch one until the wound is healed. What happens with the somatic mutations is that that cell accidentally lost notch one through the somatic mutation and is essentially fixed in that wound healing mode. So it starts to take over. So a lot of the, you know, a lot of, I mean, it probably that probably doesn't apply to all genes here, but a lot of them are probably conferring an advantage to tapping into stem cell biology or wound healing, things like that. Maybe there are questions there. Yeah. Maybe that's how it might help. Let's see that. Maybe not. Chat. I don't see. Yeah, I, can't. Why? I don't think so. No, no it doesn't look like that. No. Okay. All right. I have more questions. Yeah. Guys, if you have questions, you can ask them now on the chat. So Speak up, maybe. Yeah. So at some point you said that maybe notch can accumulate up to uh, mm -hmm. mutations, so that rival mutations. Yes. So that seems a lot to me. So are there that many drivers in the synergy? Right. Uh, drive, well, um, let me clarify that. That's 2,000 mutations in 2,000 different cells. That's first of all. So it's not a cell that has acquired 2,000 different ones. So that's the first thing. Um, two th I'm not, uh, and then the second clarification is it's not 2,000 different 
uh, mutations. It can be it can be that the same site has mutated in a hundred different sites in the same place independently. Uh, in in reality, not one is quite a lot quite a long gene, and there are quite a lot of sites, probably hundreds, not two thousand, probably hundreds of sites that can be mutated and produce a driver. But there is certainly something quite interesting coming out of the Buffalo's walk study, for example, is that we are detecting so many drivers. In the first two hundred patients, we have found donors. We have found already about four thousand different not one mutations and about a thousand different fifty three mutations. The density is so high that you start to see the same mutation many times in many patients. So you get, uh, and they are selected for, so you get a map of which sites in each gene matter. So you have an in vivo saturation mutagenesis assay in a way that you can compare to these in vitro or in silico saturation mutagenesis assays that people are. Yeah. So you showed that there was inter individual variation in the genes that were. Mutated at the same tissue, the heat yes. that I thought yeah. that was very cool. Yeah. But then you said that you think that most of it is genetic. So that would point to environmental. Right. But then the other find the second part of the dog. Yeah. Not more, necessarily. More. I mean, it could okay. be variation due to genetics, right? Or, and, for, but, and then I think. So variation across part. individuals due to, due to um, a snape, you know, a snape stir. And making that one gene being selected yeah, for, for example. Yeah. Okay, so you but think I, it's more. Well, no, no, let me clarify. Okay. I think I think the difference between uh, identical and non-identical twins suggests that there is a genetic component. Okay. It's, it's suggested because we still need to correct for the fact that identical twins tend to have more identical lives. Right. Um, so we still need to do those corrections. Uh, and obviously, when, once we have the full data set, we will do formal GWAS and, and things like that. So it remains to be tested. It's just a suggestion that it's possible based on that observation that some of that variation is genetics, but when I, it's probably some, it's for a lot of it is surely environmental. Uh, so it's probably a combination. Do you have a number in your head of percent? No, I don't know, but I would love to know that. Hopefully in the next few months we will know that once we, I mean, we just got some of this data last week. So it's just, cool. yeah, it's all very, very raw. Yeah. Also, if there is no other question, um, yeah, my question was related to, when I asked question about the super centenarian, but, um, you haven't, so, so you mentioned that the differentiated cells and the stem cells in the immune system, they behave like similar, you have this correlation, mm -hmm. but, but you haven't mentioned anything about the um, different mutation rate for signatures among the different immune cell types. How this one like something, because I was thinking that yeah. in the supercentenarian, there was a paper that they showed that there was a, being a specific CD4 yeah. subcell type right. in the supercentenarian. So, this yeah, really so we haven't done that. In this case, we only sequence granulocytes, so one yeah, particular or, cell type. So whatever is yeah, so uh, in a different study, Peter Campbell, uh, who is one of the PIs at the Sanger, has been sequencing lymphocytes of different classes uh, and people of different ages. So mm. it's that that's published, but we haven't done a systematic, you know, I think, again, the way he had to do the lymphocyte study was by isolating flow certain different um, uh, B and T cells and then taking individual being in vitro yeah. into colonies and doing whole genome sequencing. It was a really big, big study to just get estimates of mutation rates. Now with nanosig, things become much simpler, but we haven't yet mm -hmm. used it for questions like that. I think there is a question. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think someone posted a question. If you want to um, say it aloud. What? what? Says, what mechanisms? What mechanism do you think leads to damage fixation in non-divided cells? That's a great question. Um, that's a great question. Uh, some people pick, picked up on this, and, it, and, and, and you know, it's quite. It's a very good question because uh, in non-divided cells, you can have DNA damage occurring, but how how does it get into the other strands? Uh, and for us, with nanoseq, we only we only be, we are only able to detect mutations present in both the strands by definition because of the duplex method. Um, so that's a really good question. Uh, the only explanation that I can think of is that uh, when you have DNA damage events, say um, uh, spontaneous deamination of, of a 5 methyl cytosine, you get a thymine as a result of deamination. Uh, so you get a TG mismatch. This is typically repaired very accurately and the, and the new wrongly generated base is removed. But if the other base were to be fixed by DNA repair, then you would have fixed that error. Um, because there are, it's estimated that every cell has tens of thousands of DNA damage events every day. They, they need to be repaired. My guess is that 
very rare incorrect repair or fixation of some of these single stranded damage can you know uh, can become double stranded mutations. That's my guess, but but the, the true answer is we don't know. Yeah, I wanted to, I don't know if I got this right at the beginning of the talk, but did you say there's like a bias of uh, increased mutation rate in mutation? So in cancer related genes, uh, it's not an increased mutation rate, it's selection. So the mutation rate, the background mutation rate is the same, but because of the current expansion, you just see them much more frequently. So, um, and that's why a, a tool like DNDS allows you to compare this because the number of synonymous mutations in the gene is, is as expected under neutral terms. But the number of non synonymous mutations in the gene conferring selection is increased 10 or 100 fold uh, due to chronic expansion. And when you compare the SO bubbles, um, well, when you did the SO bubbles study, you showed, if I don't recall wrong, that you had like the mutation rate for a smoker person was lower than for like one that is not mm -hmm. Have you checked? Or you don't have so in with that study, we only had nine individuals, um, so we we couldn't know. Uh, it, that's exactly what we want to do mm -hmm. with these buckler swaps, and we just got data from the first two hundred. So that's what we want to do systematically. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we are assuming that the mutation rate is the same across all lifespans. Yeah. So that the younger people have lower mutation rate. Yeah. At a certain point, the mutation rate. Yeah. So, so in the 50s, um, Leo Siller, which is a physicist and the term molecular biology suggested that aging would be caused by exponential mutation rates um, because as mutations accumulate, they probably start destroying DNA repair pathways and then they accumulate faster and faster and faster until you get an error catastrophe to the post. Um, and well, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, what we find in, in, in you know, in our in our studies, uh, and if I can show you the presentation again, um, yeah, what we find is a very linear um, correlation with age. The fact that it's linear suggests that the number of mutations per year is constant throughout life. There is a, a there is a faster rate in during embryo embryogenesis and and development because you you you're born with about a 50, fifty to hundred mutations per cell after nine months of life, essentially. So it's quite a fast accumulation compared to the 20 mutations per year. But uh, you know, beyond that, as far as we can tell, it's pretty linear. And it's not what many people expect. Lots of people expect to sort of accelerate. And, yeah. you, you still see people trying to fit exponential curves to very linear uh, dots. But, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, for thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm um, yeah, I mean, I'm my group. I'm basically my group here. Yeah. Uh, no, I'll try to